Hi, Chris Valentin, and here we are in chapter 5 and chapter 6 of the Spirit Wars book. I, I hope that you got the book. I hope you're reading it. You're supposed to be all caught up, okay? You should have plenty of time to catch up. We are in the virus lockdown, at least here in California, eh? And uh, so you're probably locked up too someplace. And uh, for me, I'm just getting stuff done in the shop, man. I'm, I'm doing my... I'm doing my six foot distance from the refrigerator and I'm doing a lot of close up attention to my, my table saw and my cutoff saw. So I wanna encourage you in that, but I guess we should get to the Spirit Wars part of this. So, uh, you know, you read the story, you figured out that I had a crash when I was young, uh, I think around 22 years old. And then I had another crash about around 11, 12 years ago. And that was really surprising to me because the first time I crashed, I really had high levels of anxiety. And then I told you about demonic things that happened to me and seeing crazy stuff and really having demonic attacks. And the second time was quite different. Like I really had real reasons why I had, um, I was, I was like exhausted. My son had went through a family issue where it ended in divorce and my daughter was, um, pretty much locked herself in the in a room for a year because of some um, torment and stuff that she had going on in her life. Basically, she had a nervous breakdown. And then um, Bill was also uh, quarantined uh, for a little while because he had a particular uh, disease that turned out to be fine, but they quarantined him for a couple of, I think it was a couple of weeks. And uh, Danny Silk and I were trying to pick up his trips and our trips, and then my daughter was calling several times uh, a day, you know, with her, with her stress, not leaving the room and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. My son calling constantly and just little by little, I, I just began to be exhausted and a whole bunch of it was just not getting enough sleep. And I finally crashed and, and you're like, what does crash look like? Crash looked like I got super depressed and, you know, it was really scary to me for those of you that have depression. I actually never uh, experienced depression in my life. Maybe maybe a day or two, like a normal person, or, uh, you know, maybe we call it the blues or whatever. I've had the blues before, but I mean, never anything where I actually was completely immobile. And I was six months on the couch, like I crashed and I was on the couch and I got up uh, a little bit just to go to the restroom, but look, my brain didn't work. Like I couldn't answer an email. I tried to go in, like I would go in once or twice a week to try and just speak to our students and Kathy was sitting next to me because I had just tons of insecurity and lots of fear, but mostly high levels of depression. Like I didn't really care if the world ended tomorrow. I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't get to the place where I planned to kill myself. But if I would have, if I would have had a heart attack, I definitely wouldn't have called 911. You know, it's just like ready to be done with life. And it lasted, it was intense for probably five and a half, six months. And I um, I learned a lot. I read Carolyn Leaf's book, um, Who Switched Off My Brain. I think it's called Who Switched On My Brain Now. I think she changed the title to, so you could switch your brain back on. But I just began to learn that, uh, you remember the first time what we talked about the last couple of sessions, it was almost all spiritual. And I found this time that I was having spiritual stuff happen but the enemy was really taking advantage of a low time in my life. Like when Jesus fasted 40 days in Luke in Luke 4 and Matthew 4, and it says when he got hungry, the devil came to him. Like it came to him at his low point. And I was really in that same position. Like I was exhausted, completely exhausted. And I um I I just couldn't think. I couldn't, I couldn't actually, I couldn't carry on a conversation that was lot, you know, longer than 30, 30 or 40 seconds. I finally went to the doctor. <laughs> Let me say this. To be clear, my wife sent me to the doctor and she's like, you're getting your butt off that couch and you're going to go see a doctor. So I finally did and we did all kinds of tests and the first test came back and like, there's nothing really wrong with you. And and they gave me some uh, medication for anxiety and for depression. And I carried it around with me for about two months. And finally, you know, I mean, carried around, actually laid down for two months with it and just didn't want to take it. Asked a few of my friends and leaders, like, what do you think about taking medication for uh, for this situation? They're like, oh, God will take you through it. And 
finally I got up one morning and again, you know, hadn't slept all night. It's crazy. Like I was sleeping two hours a night. I lost like 30 pounds, which I could have actually used about 20 of it. Um, you know, so it was just, it was no appetite, you know, no sex drive, no, I mean, just no, no appetite for anything in life. And finally, one morning, Kathy said, you're going to take those pills. You're going to start taking those pills. And so I started taking them. To be honest, I, I had to, they had to change my pills out like two or three times. Finally found something that I could actually endure. And it took about six weeks. But after about six weeks, I started coming alive again. And it was really slow. Uh, and it was, um, yeah, it was, it was slow, but it was, it was slowly happening. And I learned several things. And let me, I guess I'll finish that thought. About the sixth month, about the fifth month, the Lord said to me, he said to me, you are not the savior of the world. With reference to my son, my daughter, all the things happening in my normal job. He said, you're not the savior of the world. And this is really hard to understand, but it will really speak to the people who have depression. For probably 20 minutes, I actually had hope. Like it didn't last very long, but after five months of not hearing anything from the Lord, I actually had a little glimmer of hope. And I had the, for, for the first time, I thought, I bet I'm going to get off this couch someday because my thought was I'm going to live like this the rest of my life. And then about maybe as a day or two or a few days later, recollection is not perfect, but I had this other encounter and the Lord said, there was always enough time to do everything I told you to do. And I began to realize, like, I had taken on the burdens, my family burdens, my kids, all, all the things that were going on at work, Bill being sick, all these things. Like, I was carrying the weight of Jesus, and I wasn't supposed to carry that. His burden is light. His yoke is easy. And I, I, did, I had a heavy, uh, hard burden. And I began to realize there was four factors in my life that were really messed up. The first one was I wasn't sleeping. And medication helped me. In fact, I started taking some sleep meds. I got, uh, I have to say, for those of you that maybe are doing this, like I got addicted to them. My doctor, who was really wonderful, her name was Julie Winter. Her name is Julie Winter. She uh, said, you know, we're going to get you, a, you're going to take this medication for sleep. We're going to make sure you sleep 10 hours a day. And you're going to catch up on your sleep. You're going to get addicted to the medication, but we'll wean you off the medication. That's exactly what happened. I took the medication for probably six, seven months. And then I started weaning myself off of it once I started catching up with my sleep. Sunlight, I had to go, like I was stuck in the house. That wasn't good for me. I started reading all these books on how sunlight uh, actually stimulates your serotonin. So I would take, I didn't feel like it, but I would go sit out in the sun. Uh, and I, and you know, stress, obviously exercise, food. I had to exercise. I mean, the one thing I didn't feel like doing at all is getting off the couch. And so I'm like, okay, I got to go for a walk. And, you know, if you're, you're stuck inside right now, you know, on this lockdown, I mean, you can always, even a treadmill or using your stairs as a treadmill or, you know, I, I depending on what the quarantine's like, I know, like for us, we can go outside and we can go on walks and some of the folks in New York and stuff are, are really confined, but you know, you've got to find some, even if it's running in place and doing some video exercises, watching videos and doing exercises, you got to do something to get your heart rate up. That really helps. And then food, uh, you know, you got to cut out sugar. I figured out like, I love sugar. I'm, I'm addicted to sugar, but I just had to get completely off of it. And so I, I, that's where I, that's where I started. And, and I started to get well and probably month eight, nine, you know, I'm still like definitely fragile, but I'm actually off the couch. I'm thinking I'm coming to work an hour, hour and a half, two hours a day. I can have a simple conversation with people. I still have anxiety, you know, real easy. I'm just fighting off being depressed. And I started learning some things about what, what I say to myself, like self-talk becomes really important. And of course the Bible actually calls it meditation. Uh, Joshua chapter one, I did a whole teaching on it in church a, a while back, but you know, what you say to yourself is as important as what you say to other people. I'll say this, it might be more important from the standpoint of your own personal health, because it, the way you treat you, some, some of us would never treat other people the way we treat ourselves. And so it's really important that Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I really believe that you, 
You know, that's a big ass. Everybody should have a big ass. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The camera woman's going crazy right now. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so it's really important that we treat ourselves well. You know, that false humility thing, that does not help depression. It does not help it does not help uh, uh, um, anxiety. It creates actually more of it. So like loving yourself, treating yourself well. How do I know if I'm treating myself well? Well, how would you treat a really good friend that you wanted to stay a friend? I, I mean, really, that's simple. Like becomes friends with yourself and learn to love yourself. And the last thing I'll say is on the prophetic ministry is, uh, you're like, how'd you get to prophetic ministry? Because Prophetic ministry is supposed to be encouraging, exhorting, and comforting. This really helps in these, in these times of anxiety and stress. Like Paul said to Timothy, take the prophecies that were previously spoken over you and with them fight the good fight. And so, like, what is God saying about you? Like, the circumstances right now, we're in this virus moment. And, the, and the, you know, if you watch too much of the news, you're probably like me. It's like, you know, uh, you, can, you can get, you can just... You can create tons of anxiety by spending two or three hours watching the news every day. And uh, I did that in the first, I think I told you in the first session or so, but it's super easy to like, okay, what's happening now? And, you know, there, uh, let me just tell you, the same bad news you heard yesterday, yeah, that's on there today. <laughs> and until, until, until the news agency has something worse to report about something else, you know, whether it's impeaching, impeaching the president or some, you know, war or whatever, they're just going to keep on this message. And it's basically, they're going to regurgitate like, okay, let's find another doctor who says, who has a prediction about when this is going to end and how bad it's going to get. And that, so I just told you what's on the news. So no, you don't even need to look there. Now, let me tell you, what is God saying? What's God saying about you? What's God saying about your future? What has God said about your future? And just taking your prophetic words, especially when you get afraid, and just taking those and begin to speak them out loud over you. God said I was going to be a world changer. God said I was going to marry a beautiful woman, amazing man. God said I, I, was, going to be, I was going to be a person of wealth, and I was going to share my wealth. I was going to be a generous person. God said that, that he has a plan, a better plan than I have for me. And I just began to speak those prophetic declarations, that is even better than self-talk. It's God talk. I take God's words, I put them, uh, I, I, I put them in my mouth, and I begin to speak the word. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And, you know, sometimes we're talking ourselves to death. We're talking our mohills into mountains and wondering why our dang valleys are so low. I've done it. You've done it. And what I'm getting at is right now, we need to put ourselves on a moratorium. <laughs> we need to be like Joshua walking around the walls of Jericho, not in silence, but at least saying what God says. Because when we say what the world says, our mountains are getting higher. Our depression, our anxiety is growing. Every negative, every negative chemistry in our bodies is going crazy. We're like, why do I feel so bad? You feel so bad. I feel so bad because I'm talking myself to death. What would it be like if you just put maybe your fa favorite verse on the mirror and you get up in the morning to get ready, to beautify yourself, guys and gals. And it says on your mirror, God causes all things to work together for good. So while I'm combing my hair, whatever ladies you do, <laughs> you do to make yourself so beautiful, like you're doing that, but you're looking at your verse and you're like, God causes all things to look together, to work together for good. Okay, this is an all, and it's a thing. And I began to remind myself, this thing's gonna work together for good for me. Uh, it may not be tomorrow, it might not even be this month, it might not even be this year, but ultimately God's taking this crisis and he's making it something that accelerates my life in him and in, in prosperity. And, and, I, and I'm just saying like, what if you, Treat it yourself, your inner, your inner person, your spirit, as well as you treat it your outer person in beautifying yourself. Well, I hope that helps this week. I just feel like things are getting better already. I, I feel like we're already seeing breakthrough. And maybe it's like a, a size of a man's hand, like a cloud the size of a man's hand, as Elijah's servant said to Elijah. It might just be a small cloud, but I'm calling that cloud I'm calling that cloud a breakthrough. 
And I just pray for you to have a breakthrough today. No matter where you're at, you're sitting at home afraid, like get off that couch. You're better than that. You were born, listen, you were born for battle. We're like, what do you mean by that? Because you're more than a conqueror. So how, how many you know, like this virus, you were created, you were created to rise in dark times, baby. You were born to be amazing. You were born to, for this virus. You were born where everyone else runs afraid. You like stand up as a light in the middle of your city. And you're like, we got this. We got this. And the dying and the hurting, how many know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. I mean, I literally feel like a great revival of evangelism in uh, miracles and, and evangelism are going to be the, the two tracks of this thing. I saw people getting off of getting out of beds in, in, uh, in hospitals in, in England and in Italy and in Spain and in America. And I just feel like there's a great healing revival that's going to break out in the midst of this. And God's going to turn darkness into light and he's going to cause us to rise in dark times. So if you're watching this, <laughs> Bethany's recording, she's laughing at me because I just get these mugs when I just start preaching. I'm like, this is what I get paid to do. Someone put me in front of a crowd. So, hey, I love you guys. It's going to work out. God bless you. And really, really have a great day.